is uh, someone that uh, we uh, say in a friendly way is the mayor of DC programmatic. <laughs> you, you and your team have a have a finger on the pulse pretty differently than most quote unquote outsiders uh, that either come in once every four years and talk about political advertising, but um, or or think that this is uh, cyclical in in much longer waves. But obviously, uh, political ads are ongoing and issues that are at a national, global, and local level. Right. Tell us about uh, Intermarket's role in, in working with buyers and, and kind of where uh, you've seen the demand curve uh, go, not just in this federal election, but overall the past yeah. year or two. You know, uh, it's interesting. We really started a lot of the hard work uh, for 2016 at the end of 2014. Uh, that was really sort of the testing grounds or the battlegrounds to lay out bigger plans. Uh, for the months to come. And uh, what we've seen, uh, as, as we see on the commercial, on the consumer side, is an increase in programmatic in a lot of different forms. Uh, we're fortunate that we have a lot of long-standing relationships with all sides um, because of our scale, because of our ability to be able to reach uh, you know, folks that really move the needle on elections, like independents um, and a lot of different sort of voter, voter groups uh, at scale. Um, we're really a great opportunity for all sides. Uh, but what that means is that now you've seen a lot of uh, diversification in the different types of programmatic buying. Uh, we've been extremely active uh, with private marketplace deals, uh, lighting up very specific deal IDs across a number of exchanges, uh, and now even utilizing some of our header integrations to be able to execute deals at scale. And I think that's what's really exciting is that buyers now have a whole lot more choice uh, and, and what we've spent a lot of time over the past uh, you know, three or four years is uh, making sure that we have uh, all of the sort of pipe work set up correctly. Uh, next, be able to make sure there's no restrictions on flow and then be able to appropriately uh, evangelize supply. And it's all sort of in that order combined with the great relationships we've always had uh, that's really bringing us success uh, with, with those buyers. So. How has your team found the ROI in the PMPs specifically? Is it similar to you know, guaranteed good old-fashioned IOs where some work and some don't. Has the juice been worth the squeeze in first the effort and time that it takes today still to execute private exchange deals? And then has the CPM premium been worth the other benefits of first-party data from the publishers, earlier access, other uh, bells and whistles? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And, and I think one of the best indicators of, of how uh, how well it's performing or the ROI that a buyer uh, is getting out of their executions is really do they do more, right? If they don't and it's not working, they pull back. And uh, what we've been seeing is that they've actually increased spend on guarantees. Uh, the return is there, which is interesting because, you know, a lot of banners and videos are not traditionally good fundraising sort of tools for the early stages and the primaries, uh, but that's actually been different uh, this year where they've actually performed very well. Um, and now as we moved out of the performance uh, sort of side of the political advertising and now start to move more into persuasion, getting out to vote, name recognition, uh, and turnout. Um, that's where you now start to see a lot of the premium CPMs come out. So a very healthy double-digit CPMs. Um, and also, um, as we know, the, sort of the data and, and the targeting is really important you know, early on. You, know, you have a couple different stages, and that's where you would see significantly sort of higher CPMs, but in small pockets to reach very specific targets. But now you have uh, an increase in scale over premium price points, and that leads to much larger spends. One of the other larger trends that's just starting to go broader in the consumer space has been multi-channel or, or cross-channel, uh, not just for attribution purposes, but leveraging different data sources in uh, being able to then execute across media channels. Political spend, obviously, and cause marketing have opportunities not just with good old-fashioned traditional mail, but email and other services where there have been banks of data established yeah. for decades in some industries or some causes. Has, have you found uh, the top brands or agencies being able to bring that in effectively and then execute off of that in media spend or it's more theory than practice today? Yeah, no, that's a great question, and I think uh, what you see on, you know, on, on on two different sides is actually a very different sort of data strategy, right? You know, one uh, group has a, almost a repository, if you will, where everyone can sort of reach in and use that, and then you have a little bit more of a fractured sort of, you know, data set, um, but it's still employed in a lot of different ways. I think the key is to be able to, uh, you know, en enable the buyer to use their data in real time. 
And that's where, as media companies and publishers, you can be successful to allow your buyers to utilize that data in real time. And, uh, and, and what we're seeing also in terms of how they're using the data and how they're using cross-channel is actually, uh, instead of saying, you know, email is this one channel and, you know, uh, traditional display is in this channel and, you know, searches in this channel, you start to actually see, uh, you know, almost like a user graph continue to emerge and you start to see better planning, better strategy, better, you know, tactical components. And uh, it's been very exciting to, to see where the tech and the data come together to reach their targets. Forget about the... Um, the opinion of either party, but give us give us a prediction. It's it's uh, early February 2017. What is the losing party, or even the winning uh, party in the U.S. federal election, going to say? Oh, I wish we would have done X. Uh, we would have had better results. What's the one thing that you're not seeing, and you're not allowed to say spend more money? Um, yeah. And uh, certainly, you know, feel free to, to leave out your own views. But yeah. what what would uh, what are you seeing is missing in terms of just smarter digital marketing that isn't happening today? That they're going to look back and say, okay, lesson learned for next time. It's interesting. I, I think uh, all sides have been using uh, a, a number of the traditional great sort of workhorses very well. Um, but I think in the future, as you know, you're trying to communicate sometimes complex uh, ideas. You're trying to communicate, um, you know, a personality. You're trying to communicate, um, you know, how you're going to govern. And I think this is where you're going to start to see in the future uh, an emergence of almost like branded content, where you'll start to see almost native opportunities where it's less about you know pure performance, and you're going to have you know pieces where you're going to get to learn you're going to engage and communicate these higher level concepts. And that's where I think uh, you're going to see a lot more campaigns sort of focus their energy and time, combine that with the great traditional digital workhorses and drive the overall outcome, which is 51% or more.